This month, we have Nintendo Power number 52 for September of 1993, and with it, what I would argue to be the first remaster game collection in video gaming. Our cover game for this issue is Super Mario All-Stars. The cover in particular showcases Super Mario The Lost Levels, with Mario being about to pick up, or avoid, a poison mushroom. The ads in the beginning of the issue are normally for, well, subscriptions to the magazine or for the strategy guide, occasionally for a new controller peripheral like the Power Glove, but in this issue we have an ad for the brand new top loader NES and with it the dog bone controller. It's rare, at least now, and the top loader design is undoubtedly superior to the original NES in terms of avoiding breakage. But, honestly, unlike the Super Nintendo and the Famicom, the top loader doesn't have a cartridge release latch where you, you press it and it lets the game out. And the size of NES cartridges makes it a little iffy from a putting it in your entertainment st center standpoint, as opposed to, honestly, the VHS style, VCR style form factor of the NES. And this is something which I've had to accommodate around with my Retron 5 of my own personal entertainment center. Now, obviously, if the cartridges were made with the Famicom form factor in the first play, first case and a cassette tape player inspired design instead of a VHS inspired design, this would be a, less of an issue. But it's late. It's a bit late for this now. In the letters column, the topic is about what Nintendo merch people would like to see. Moving past the more absurd suggestions and into the more viable ones, we have Super Mario Kart RC cars, which I believe now are actually a thing that exists, so props to whoever suggested that. Starting off with Super Nintendo titles, we have Final Fight 2, now with the three-character roster. This time, our heroes are on a world tour to take down Mad Gear overseas. The article has power-up notes and maps for the full game. Final Fight 2 is a dramatic improvement over the original Final Fight, with the three-character roster fitting the three main play styles for brawlers. Hagar for the slow but powerful style, Maki for the fast speedster, and Carlos right in the middle. The level and enemy design is generally better, though there are some issues. For example, the second boss in the game's main attack, a chest rush, has priority over pretty much anything except jump kicks, which would not be an issue, except for the fact that he can time his attack animation with the first frame for where you're vulnerable when you're getting back up, which is also a situation where you can't perform any button inputs to get out of the way. Otherwise, the game is very solid, and that, combined with the, with the two-player, makes this a much better, much more enjoyable title than the first game in the series. Next up, we have Super Mario All-Stars. I consider this the first video game remaster collection, as we have three games that were are getting re-released years after their initial release, with a dramatic graphical overhaul at a higher resolution and with the addition of new features for quality of life purposes. That's pretty much the modern criteria for remastered game collections like, well, Shadow of the Colossus HD Remaster, God of War HD Remaster, um, hell, like the Master Halo Master Chief Collection, all of that stuff. The article itself puts a particular focus on the Lost Levels, or Super Mario 2 Japan, mapping much of the game and setting up a contest to see who can beat World 9, which can only be accessed by beating all eight worlds without warps. If you send proof, you get a patch. Now, if you have earned one of these patches, please post in the comments, and if possible, Post a link to a photograph on Google Photo or Flickr or some other hosting site for of your of your achievement. Anyway, because of this, because of this focus on this particular of the games of the collection, that's the game I'll be reviewing. So an important thing to mention about Super Mario All-Stars, making it different from the original games. The physics have been tweaked slightly. Super Mario, as opposed to regular Mario, Mario, takes a little more distance to get up to speed. If you haven't gotten up to speed, your jump arc ends up being just a little bit shorter, both as regular and Super Mario. It's not a massive difference, but it's just enough to possibly throw off your mus muscle memory. To make up for this, the game has a continue option baked in. 
And for Super Mario Bros. 1, the lost levels, and 2, this means you are not continuing at the beginning of the world, as you did with the first two games, but on whatever level you got a game over on. Meaning that if you game over the second level in a world, that's the level you continue on. Additionally, the game has an option to let you save your progress in one of three slots and pick up your play later, which is a fantastic quality of life feature. That aside, how is the Lost Levels? Well, I understand why it didn't come to the US. The game escalates Lost more quickly than the first game. It assumes you've already played and beaten the original game, and thus it consequently skips most of the tutorializing with a difficulty that puts you at about the same place as World 3. I say World 3, not 4, because World 4 is the first level to introduce Maze Castle. They don't start off quite there. That said, it does some things to make the game a little less cruel. Aside from the consistent continue system, it also adjusts the sprites for poison mushrooms to make it more clear that poison mushrooms are what they are. For the breeze, for levels with wind, they adjust the graphics where there are more visual cues to let you know what way the wind blows. That sort of thing. So it is more approachable than the original version, but still, it's still kind of tough. Now, if you're the kind of player who's making these, who's making it through those extremely hard Mario Maker levels with Super Mario 1 physics, you probably can take this just fine. But, still, if you're more of, I would say Mario casual, then, this might be the term to use, then you may want to take the time to go through Super Mario 1 as a refresher before going into Super Mario The Lost Levels. We haven't done a review of a RPG for a while, so here's a new one, The Seventh Saga from Enix. We have info on each of the playable characters, along with the world map and recommended quest order, along with some general strategies. Seventh Saga is a little closer to Dragon Quest than Final Fantasy in its gameplay style. It's more grindy like Dragon Quest, particularly in the early going. Additionally, the game doesn't provide feedback as to how weapon stats compare to your current stats, meaning that if you want to see how other weapons compare with yours before buying them, you kind of have to have the fact open. I can't say if this information was in the manual. Otherwise, the game controls fairly well, and the narrative concepts are pretty good. I like the concept, which is not pictured in this video, that each of the seven heroes, and, well, any ones you don't select, that is, to join your party or to be your personal character can end up potentially being your rival later in the game. It gives the title a degree of real replay value that a lot of console RPGs don't necessarily have. We next have our second Super Nintendo title from Blizzard, or what will become Blizzard, a RC Pro-Am styled racer with licensed music, rock and roll racing. We have maps of all of the game's tracks. So, Rock and Roll Racing's controls and HUD are a little better than RC Pro-Am, in part because it handles the variety of options a bit better, though it's not without issues. The camera distance is closer than the distance in RC Pro-Am, which works well enough, but it could be better. The isometric camera, camera perspective in particular also has some problems with lighting up jumps, which can lead to some surprise crashes. Other than that, the game controls incredibly well, and the versions of the songs included in the game are fantastic, with the chiptune version of Paranoid in particular being great. This is so much so that I would not be shocked that if I had gameplay audio here, I that this version of that this video would get content ID flagged. We have coverage here of several sports games, each given enough time to be reasonably showcased and thus we'll get reviews. We have Boxing, Legends of the Ring, Super Baseball 2020, Konami's NFL Football, Super Off-Road The Baja, GP1, and F1 Pole Position. With Boxing Legends of the Ring, give the game credit, it has controls which basically would work just fine on the NES. What the Super Nintendo brings to the table is the graphical horsepower to allow the player and their opponent to have very large sprites that can perform the level of dodging, weaving, and, well, punching that you would expect from a boxing simulation is that is what this is. It's got the license of The Ring magazine, a very prestigious boxing magazine. 
Also, the game's credit, it has a character creator, which lets you build your own fighter and s pick their stats. The actual appearance side of the character creator is rather poor, only allowing you to select your boxer's skin color, in turn preventing you from trying to create other boxers that are not present in the game, like Foreman, Ali, or Frazier. That said, while the game gives you some feedback on your stamina, it's not clear on what your or your opponent's health is. Instead of a life bar, it shows a facial expression for each character. This works in something like Doom or Wolfenstein because it's also working in conjunction with an actual health meter. Instead, we just have to look at the facial expressions of the two boxers, both your opponent and yourself, and guess, which is not helpful. Super Baseball 2020 has a really neat concept for a baseball game, by putting it in the future and having it played by robots. The controls are very standard for a baseball game, and it does some things I really like. Your outfielders in the game have the same level of well AI that the opposing team does, meaning that if the computer hits a pop fly, your outfielders will get underneath it on their own, not as opposed to you having to guess when you can't see the ball or the player. Now you can end up getting out of the way if you accidentally hit the controller, but generally the outfielders are quite competent on their own. Consequently, this makes the game much more of a battle between the pitcher and the batter. As additional form of game balance, over the course of the game you get cash for just general good play, getting opposing players out, getting runners on base, and so on. You can use that cash over the course of the game to upgrade your team. This adds a new resource management side to the game. Once you've gotten a good lead, if your opponent is in a position to catch up, do you splurge to upgrade your pitcher to shut them down? If you load the bases, do you upgrade your batter in the hopes of getting a Grand Slam home run? That sort of thing. Frankly, this makes for one of the best baseball games I've played thus far for this show. Konami's NFL football felt absolutely unplayable. I really couldn't tell what I was doing in the game, or how to properly control it. It doesn't help that the game's menus don't have information on, on the game's controls, nor could I find a fact with information on the game's controls. So, unless you're getting a copy with a manual, skip this. Super Off-Road The Baja uses a behind-the-back perspective and a Mode 7-ish map, like a whole bunch of other behind-the-back racing games like F-Zero, but it has hills and dips to it as the game is an off-road rally race. This also leads into the game's problems, as the title doesn't just give you a course with competing racers, it gives you a whole bunch of obstacles to run into in order to cause damage to your vehicle, which you can't necessarily see in advance because of the hills, and some of these are spawned randomly, spawned randomly, not like bushes and trees and that sort of thing, but like, there's ATVs on the track for some reason. There's spectators along the side of the road, that sort of thing. And you can either drive into them on accident because you were placed wrong coming over a hill and you didn't see it coming, or you're knocked into them by opposing vehicles, or because in some cases your vehicle's sprite is in the way, which is crappy. On top of this, the tracks are littered with obstacles with, which instead of damaging you when you hit them, will die and cost you money if you hit them for any reason. Again, like the ATVs, or, for that matter, um, deer. Yes, there's deer that will wander across the track. They will die and cost you money, as opposed to damaging you or providing delicious venison. It's a bloody nuisance. Going from the camera perspective, I was actually looking forward to playing this game, because I one of the problems I had with the off-road series before is because of the camera perspective and the zoomed out, track all on one screen view, and having a more immersive perspective like this took advantage of the graphical hardware of the Super Nintendo looked exciting, and this really bums me out. Next we have GP1, and one definite positive about GP1, which is a motorcycle racing game, not motocross, motorcycle track racing game, is that the animation of the riders in this game are fantastic. Their movements are tremendously fluid, and it really helps to give you some information on how close you are on the bike to tipping over. That said, the bikes feel really rough to control. I never got the right sense of how much braking I should do in the turns, 
whether I should be feathering the accelerator or bouncing back and forth between the brake and gas or pressing both pedals at once when it came to cornering. F1 pole position is of no relation whatsoever to the arcade game, aside from the fact that it's a Formula 1 racing game. This is more of a simulator with an official license, with the names of like actual big name drivers like Michael Schumacher in here, and a middle of the road tack when it comes to realism or and grit in your Formula 1 game. The game itself controls well, though your racer slows incredibly fast, and has a bit of power side to him that I that I don't normally think of when it comes to Formula 1 cars. Additionally, when playing single player, rather than going with a full screen perspective, the game sticks with a split screen view. Fortunately, rather than having the lower the second screen be another driver, which would be confusing, the player's vehicle is in the lower screen while the entire upper screen is a rear view mirror view. It's a bit excessive actually, but it kind of works. I'd still prefer having the full field of view used for the HUD of your vehicle in single player. What is something of an issue though is the lack of feedback when it comes to figuring out how far ahead your opponents are. There's no real information on how many seconds the front car has on you, or even just the next car ahead in the rankings has on you, which makes it hard to tell if you're gaining, particularly if you've blown away from the blown off the lower racers in the track and you're not seeing the next bunch of guys up. This can be incredibly discouraging as it leads to a sense that you're not getting anywhere, that, for lack of a better term, you are just spinning your wheels. Currently, I'd put Top Gear as my preferred real racing game for the Super Nintendo. Next up is a Super Nintendo adaptation of Family Feud. Considering part of the strategy of the show, as much as trivia games have strategy, is predicting the survey responses of the kind of people who would be in the audience for Family Feud, and this game is missing that aspect, I'm going to skip this title. In classified information, we have quick restart codes for Bubsy, which has suddenly become topical thanks to E3, and Firepower 2000. I'm assuming this is something from quality testing that got left over before the final version of the game was released. In this installment of the Star Fox comic, the spirit of Fox's father tells him that Andros and Slippy can be found on Fortuna. The team attack, Slippy gets three free, and Andros's pet Gidra turns on him. Moving on to Game Boy titles, we have the final Game Boy installment of the Saga series with Final Fantasy Legend 3. We get a walkthrough of the early parts of the game. Final Fantasy Legend 3 is a lot more simplified than earlier games in the series. You're not creating your own party, as in earlier games. Instead, you have a party of four characters who will go through the whole game. You start out as two mutants and two humans, and no robots. However, you can change braces by equipping certain items and eating meat. Eating meat moves you more and more towards becoming a beast, and equipping cybernetic equipment turns you more and more towards becoming a robot. The title gets rid of a few of the obnoxious issues from equipment in the first two games. Specifically, weapon degradation is gone. You do not have to worry about your sword wearing out in the middle of the fight, nor do you have to carry a golf bag worth of crap around with you in terms of weapons and spells and that sort of thing. However, this also means the game is more grindy than earlier titles in the series, more for experience than for gear. Monsters top a, drop a ton of cash, so it doesn't take a lot of grinding to get your necessary gear, but you still have to get that experience so that you are sufficiently leveled up for the enemies in the dungeons that you face in the future. This is a good game, and probably one of the more approachable games in the series. Certainly it's one that's more playable for newcomers, and certainly won't require you to put together a notebook full of flowcharts to keep track of mutant evolutions. Next up is a Game Boy port of Felix the Cat with maps and info on power-ups. Felix the Cat gets the sprite ratio for characters in the field of view perfect. Or should I say, perfect. Where it runs into a few issues is how with how the jump physics works. It's just a little too floaty. This is aggravated by the fact that timing isn't quite right for the springboards, and in particular for when you hit the jump button to boost your jump. That said, the game is generally solid. It's really starting to feel like game designers are getting the hang of what it takes to make a good, functional, enjoyable-to-play platformer on the Game Boy. 
Wrapping up Game Boy titles, we have Pinball Dreams, a Game Boy pinball game with three different tables. Of the three tables in Pinball Dreams, the first table, Ignition, is probably the best designed with a setup for, the skills, for a skill shot at the very beginning, along with a reasonable number of targets to hit on the board. The problem, however, and this is for every table in the game, lies with the controls. Specifically, while the right flipper is mapped to the A button, which works just fine for the purpose, or, uh, the left flipper is mapped to the D-pad, which is mushy, and thus has a slow reaction time when it comes to trying to keep the ball in play. I don't entirely blame the developers for this. That layout is intuitive when it comes to choosing controller inputs on the Game Boy for a pinball game. It's just that the input sensitivity for the D-pad is a little off here. It's probably something that somebody could write an emulation patch for, for if you're playing this on a Retron 5 or something similar, but still, it's a nuisance. In Counselor's Corner, we have info on how to cheese the king in the arena in Shadowrun, and also solve some other quests, and more maps for Star Fox. We have an article on the making of Super Empire Strikes Back, including how they brought critters that were considered for the film, but never made it off the design board, into the video game, among other things. In the Top 20 column, the Super Nintendo rankings have both versions of Street Fighter 2 in the Top 10, with Turbo just outside of the Top 5 and the original game being bumped down to second place. So, we'll see if Street Fighter 2 Turbo manages to overtake. In the NES section, we have Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, an action platformer based on the last Indiana Jones film before Crystal Skull, which I is a movie that people say exists, but I'm pretty sure it does not. The article has maps of the first four levels. Man, this game is bad. There are several major problems. The first is with the controls. The game uses A and B for two different attacks, with both buttons being pressed to jump. This didn't work well in the Double Dragon games on the NES, and it doesn't work well here. The puzzle design for puzzle level doesn't help either, with the game taking the secrets from Venice from the film and turning it into a, a sliding block puzzle, which you have to do on a timer, which... Not a fan, honestly. There's honestly more that could have done here, too, because there's much more to the Venice sequence, both in terms of action sequences, like Indy Fate fleeing the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword, who show up for the first time here, or having to outrace the flames, or something. Instead, there's a really uneven gameplay style that just doesn't quite work. Our last NES title of the issue is Tiny Toons Cartoon Workshop, which is like Mario Paint, but with Tiny Toons from Konami and on the NES instead of the beefier Super Nintendo. So I'm going to skip this title because the Super what makes Mario Paint work is the power of the Super Nintendo hardware when it comes to graphics and sound, in particular sound for music composition. In the Now Playing column, of note in the Also Rans is Wing Commander The Secret Missions, which gets covered next issue, so we'll talk about it then. In Pack Watch, we have Cool Spot and World Heroes, both for the Super Nintendo. Choosing Super Mario All-Stars as my pick of the issue would be too easy. So I think we could just take that as a given that you should get Super Mario All-Stars and choose a second pick to go with it. So what do I pick for that? Seventh Saga is a really neat JRPG and one that is clearly designed to really promote multiple playthroughs. So I'm going to give that my pick at least on the single-player side of things, and we actually have a two-player pick this week as well, because I would put Super Baseball 2020 as a solid pick for a two-player game, or even cooperative, two players on the same team. So, I don't know if it does that or not, but in any case, that. Next time... Dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover, or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.